Steve Cole, and I was the pastor here from 1992 until uh, through 2018, and um, appreciate Pastor Dave picking up the mantle, and he's doing a wonderful job, and Andy and the elders, and so we're still a part of this fellowship. Um, Dave asked me to fill in this week and next as he's in California, and um, this week is, as you know, Thanksgiving when we all eat more than we should, and so I'm going to talk to you today about (laughs) self-control, and I'll be selling indulgences after the um, service here uh, so that you can enjoy your Thanksgiving, Just kidding, but a couple of uh, resources available to you this morning that are at the exits, and if you need some, or if you need a Bible, lift your hand, and there's an outline, and I'm going to be referring to this sheet that's biblical character qualities and spiritual diagnostic questions, and there's also a sermon booklet that's printed with the... um, manuscript of the message, and I'm praying that um, the Lord will use this message to each of us apply to our own lives, because on a message like this, my tendency and yours, I'm sure, is to go, man, I wish my wife would apply this, you know, I wish my kids would apply this, but me, my, I'm doing good. Uh, And I think the Lord wants each of us to apply it to ourselves and not judge others who may be struggling with some other issues that aren't our problem or our our weakness. Um, And so I'm going to read Galatians 5, um, 16 down through verse 23, but we're only going to focus on the last part of verse 23, but I want you to have the context. Uh, The apostle Paul writes, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But If you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such things, there is no law. Dear Lord, as we come to your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit would apply it as each one has need um, and give us the strength and the grace to apply it personally. And uh, I ask that your word would not return to you void without accomplishing your purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. What uh, do the following people have in common? The drunk who is on skid row, the student who's flunking out of college because he never studies, the person who's always late for appointments, the compulsive eater, the smoker who's addicted to tobacco, the man who frequently looks at pornography, the drug addict, and the Christian who never grows because he just never spends time uh, alone with God. And the answer, the common denominator among all of those is they lack 
the fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control. In my over 40 years of serving as a pastor, I, I, I would say that the presence or absence of self-control is one of the most determinative factors on whether you will do well in your walk with God or not so well uh, and have serious problems. It affects everything. It affects how you manage your time, your money, or the money God has entrusted to you, uh, your ability to overcome temptations such as sex and alcohol and drugs and that sort of thing, uh, your development of godly character qualities, controlling your temper and your tongue, relating uh, or, or regulating, I should say, your health through proper diet and exercise and rest, and then... Uh, most importantly, whether or not you spend consistent time in God's word and in prayer. All of those are affected by this fruit of self-control. And I think it's probably the most neglected fruit of the Spirit uh, in the list there that Paul gives. Uh, now, I have a tough sales job on my hands this morning because... Honestly, we're all suckers for the quick-fix approach to the spiritual life. Um, an ad will promise things like, just pop this pill, and you don't have to worry about what you eat. You can eat junk food all day long. You can sit on your couch and watch TV and never exercise, but you'll lose 50 pounds. And, you know, people actually spend money on those kind of sucker ads that draw you in thinking, Easy, quick, I don't have to do all the hard work. Yeah, I'll buy it. Uh, but, of course, you can promise them a weight loss program that is guaranteed and won't cost a dime, and they won't do it. You say, well, what is that? Eat the proper kind of food in the proper amount and exercise every day, and you'll lose weight. you taking in less calories than you're burning off. And do the math, and it works. But people don't want to do that. Why? Because that requires self-discipline or self-control. And spiritually, um, this fruit is effective, but it's not a quick fix. Self-control. And you get these spiritual hucksters, I'm going to call them, and uh, don't mean any offense, but I, I think that's what they are. And they come along and say, just get slain in the spirit. Or just speak in tongues and all your spiritual problems will go away. Bingo. You know, you'll be above temptation and so on. And that is like sp selling spiritual snake oil. It doesn't work. And self-control is a fruit. Do any of you know how to produce instant fruit? I love peaches, but they don't grow instantly. You know, or a good crisp apple it takes time and cultivation. And there are a lot of factors involved. And maybe you have a good crop this year, and next year it doesn't work so well because it's just involved, and it, it requires time and effort and knowledge and a lot of things to get a good crop. And that's the way it is with this fruit of self-control. But it is God's prescribed means to godliness. And so the main idea, it's there in your outline, uh, that our text, I think, wants us to learn is that God wants you to control your life under the control of his Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to look at three aspects of this subject. First of all, what is self-control? Secondly, how do you get it? And then thirdly, uh, where do you need it? So first of all, what is self-control? Self-control is the inward, and I'm going to expound on this, but it's the inward rule and regulation 
of every area of your life under the control, the ultimate authority and control of God's spirit in line with his word. Uh, the Greek word comes from a word that means power or, le or lordship. Uh, a Jewish writer by the name of Philo, way back in the early part of the first millennium, described it as having superiority over every desire. In our text, you'll notice that it stands in opposition to these deeds of the flesh, verses 19 to 21, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, uh, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and then he throws in a catch-all term and things all like these. So if any of these things are sort of, yeah, I kind of am like that, then that area is not under the control of the Holy Spirit. Paul lists self-control as a qualification for elders in Titus 1.8. Peter includes it in 2 Peter 1 in a list of godly character qualities that we all are to develop. And uh, Pastor Stan has a book in print on that passage that uh, is about discipleship. But by definition, self-control means that you overrule your momentary emotions because you have a higher goal. Um, and your higher goal is, I want to please and honor God, and so I have to go against my instant feeling here for that higher goal. And I won't go back through it, but many of those deeds of the flesh are um, directly related to the emotional aspect of life. So several things here then, just to uh, unpack that statement about self-control. First of all, self-control is primarily inward and only secondarily outward. Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, that refers to sexual immorality, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness, all these evil things, Jesus said, proceed from within and defile the man or the person. And so it follows that if we only control uh, these things outwardly, while inwardly we're um, not dealing with it, you know, maybe we'll want to look good in front of people, so we control our temper, but inwardly we're saying, oh, I hope that person dies, you know, they just wronged me, rah, rah, rah. but you smile and you keep a good front. Well, that kind of behavior, of course, is just putting a Band-Aid on the cancer of the heart. And so spirit control goes down deep to the heart level and allows us to deal with temptation on that level before it goes any farther. And that's one of the most important spiritual lessons I've learned is when I'm tempted, stop, deal with it right there. As Jesus put it, pluck out the eye, cut off the hand, get radical in cutting out the sin, and it won't go any farther. But if I entertain it mentally, pretty soon it comes out. A second thing about self-control, it operates under spirit control. And there's a paradox here, isn't there? Spirit control results in being self-controlled. And as we walk by the spirit, as verse 16 tells us, he produces in us the ability to control every area of our lives in line with his holy purposes. And so this implies active responsibility on your part. Sometimes teachers on the spiritual life will say that you're just to be passive. Let go and let God. Or I've heard some say, 
if you're striving, you're not abiding. Abiding is this effortless, passive thing where the branch abides in the vine and the life of the vine flows into you and there's no work involved and he produces the fruit in you. And that's totally unbiblical. Pastor Dave hit on that well a few weeks ago. Um, the, the spiritual life involves striving. I could cite several verses, but here's one, Colossians 1.29. Paul says, For this purpose I also labor. Who labors? Paul did. Striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. So you see the, the two there? Paul's striving, but he's doing it according to God's power that works within him. Both are true. And so the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. A third thing to note is that self-control is not self-willed, but it is connected with your will. Uh, in Titus 1.8, Paul says an elder must not be self-willed. Um, or, or excuse me, in 1.8 he says an elder is to be self-controlled, but in the verse right before Titus 1.7, he says that an elder is not to be self-willed. And so, <clears throat> what's the difference? Well, the difference is the self-controlled person under the Spirit is submitting himself to God's will as revealed in his word, whereas the self-willed person is kind of on his own agenda. Uh, he's got his own selfish desires, doesn't care what God's word says. But this is for those who are believers. As I'll mention in a moment, unbelievers can be self-controlled, but this is a work of God's Spirit. And if you've never been born again through faith in Christ, where you've come to the cross, admitted that you were a sinner, needed the salvation he offers, then everything I'm saying in this message is really not for you. That's the first step in spirit control. But because God has given us new life in Christ and he's given us the Holy Spirit to indwell us, uh, we now have both the responsibility and the ability to yield to his revealed will and not do our own will. A fourth thing I raise is that self-control is not legalism. I have been accused of being legalistic when I have preached spirit uh, self-control or Spirit-led self-control, and um, Christians seem to be oblivious to the fact the context in which self-control appears here happens to be the letter that Paul wrote to battle legalism, the letter of Galatians. That's what the whole letter is about. Um, legalism is an attempt to earn standing with God by your good behavior or, you know, your deeds that you're doing for others and all of that, and you think it's going to offset your sin, it doesn't. Um, legalism also is an attempt to look spiritual to others because you do certain things and they don't, and so you congratulate yourself and you judge others who don't have your standards, and it's, it's all outward, it's all the flesh, Whereas we're talking here about an inward quality that uh, is dealing with your heart before God. God examines the heart. And so living under God's grace produces self-control. Now one other problem is people mistake God's grace for kind of being a hang loose, sloppy, don't worry about obedience kind of lifestyle. And Often grace and legalism, uh, I mean licentiousness and legalism, are shown as two opposites with grace kind of the balance point. That's a bad analogy. Grace is totally opposed to license and legalism, which are both flip sides of the flesh. They're both opposed to God's grace. Uh, God's grace, Titus 2, 11 and 12, Paul said, God's grace instructs us, and that word instructs means to discipline or to uh, train us as a parent trains a child, 
He said, God's grace instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. And so, grace properly understood produces godliness. It doesn't produce legalism. It doesn't produce licentious, loose, um, ignore the Bible kind of living. A fifth thing, <clears throat> self-control is not asceticism. Uh, do you know that word? The ascetic denies himself certain legitimate um, comforts or pleasures, and he imposes hardships, and he thinks that that's going to gain him some spiritual value. That's behind the whole monastic movement, join a monastery, eat a meager diet, sleep on a hard mat in the cold room, and maybe take a vow of poverty too, maybe uh, you'll control the flesh. Martin Luther tried that, <clears throat> and he found out it didn't work until he finally discovered the gospel. Uh, the Apostle Paul describes that approach at the end of Colossians 2, and then he concludes in Colossians 2.23, after describing asceticism, he says, these are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but they are of no value against fleshly indulgence. No value. Now, at the same time, Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 9 the example of an athlete who disciplines himself because he's got a goal in mind. He wants to win. And so he runs with uh, purpose. He disciplines his body. And Paul goes on to say that he himself disciplined his own body so that he would not be disqualified in the day of judgment um, from preaching the gospel. And so your motive for why you discipline yourself is absolutely uh, crucial. Um, for example, you can rightly, and I've done this, <clears throat> set your alarm clock early so that you can get up and meet with the Lord. And that's a good thing. You should do that. But if your motive is to congratulate yourself and maybe boast to others of, yep, had my quiet time seven times this week, uh, you're into legalism or asceticism. Um, it's not going to gain you points with God, and if you're trying to boast to others, then you're into the legalist kind of thing. So motive is crucial. And then <clears throat> one final thing is that um, this is not... Oh, somebody stole my water. I hope this is water. <laughs> I put a cup of water up here before the service, and it's gone. Um, anyway, um, <clears throat> self-control is not rigid, but it's flexible, and uh, there's a danger on being too self-controlled to the point that you're not able to respond to various kinds of situations that spontaneously arise, arise and you, you end up not loving others. Uh, one example. As I said, it's good to get up and read your Bible and pray every morning. So you got little ones in your home, and you're reading your Bible and praying, and your two-year-old exuberantly jumps into your lap and shows you a picture he colored for you, and you say, go away, can't you see I'm reading my Bible? Well, that's not self-control. Uh, you're not loving, and love is one of the fruits of the Spirit. You're not being kind and patient and gracious. And so you have to be flexible enough, to, and you have to realize that the goal of self-control is the two great commandments, love God and love others. And my counsel would be, hug your little two-year-old and tell him, that's wonderful, thank you. And then you can go back to your time with the Lord. But uh, don't be so rigid on this that you're not flexible to love people. Uh, that's part of it. So that's what it is. Now what's the question, second question, how do you get this quality? 
And <clears throat> here I just want to say there are some of you, us, maybe it's us firstborns, I don't know, but by natural temperament, we're disciplined, we're goal-oriented, and we can do this pretty much on our own. And it's true with unbelievers. You see athletes who are disciplined as all get out because they want to go to the Olympics or they want to be on a pro team. Or you'll see musicians who practice for hours because they want to be concert level um, musicians. Or businessmen, again, who are incredibly disciplined and hardworking, and they do it all without the Holy Spirit. So you, you have to realize by temperament, <clears throat> some of us can do this more easily than others. And the same thing is true, by the way, of all of the fruit of the Spirit. There are people who are just naturally buoyant and joyous. There are other people who by nature are depressed, and they've got to fight for joy, as John Piper puts it. Uh, there are people by nature who are calm, relaxed, nothing ruffles them. There are other people by nature who are just a nervous wreck over every little thing, anxious to have the fruit of the spirit of peace. they got to work harder. And the same is true here with self-discipline. Um, but my point is this. Paul does not say that those who by nature are more free-spirited, hang loose, undisciplined, can get a free pass on this one. He says the fruit of the Spirit is, and he gives these nine qualities, and I would argue all of them are to be growing in all of us who are walking by means of the Spirit. So to be godly, to be Christ-like, you have to be self-controlled. And what that means in one sentence as to how you get it, you get self-control by walking in the Spirit, in the Spirit's control, as you live in accordance with God's purpose for your life. Now, let me give you a step-by-step -step way to implement this in your life. First of all, write a one-sentence <clears throat> purpose statement for your life. One-sentence purpose statement. You say, where is that in the Bible? Uh, granted, there is no s simple verse that says it, but... I'm going to build my case by saying Jesus and Paul were both crystal clear on where they were going in life. They had a goal. They knew what they were doing. Let me read you a few verses. Matthew 6.33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come, here's his purpose, to seek and to save that which is lost. John 17, 4, Jesus says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Jesus knew what the Father gave him to do. He did it. Um, 1 Corinthians 9, 23, Paul says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Or Philippians chapter 3, uh, first part of verse 8. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. That was his goal. And then jumping down to verse 12, at the end he says, I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. He knew why Christ had laid hold of him. He pressed on to attain that goal. Or 1 Timothy 4, 7, Paul simply says, discipline <clears throat> yourself for the purpose of godliness. And I could go to many other verses. For sake of time, I won't. But Jesus and Paul were both men of godly purpose. They knew why God had them on this planet. They lived according to it. That was their goal. And so my counsel is this. Picture yourself on your deathbed and ask the question, what do I want to have accomplished with my life? And that's going to differ with all of us. 
Uh, I'll give you my personal purpose statement that I came up with years ago, and here it is. To glorify God by being a godly husband and father. If I fail on the family level, I've failed. So I wanted to be a godly husband and father, to live it out there, and to use my gift of pastor-teacher for the building up of the body of Christ and the furtherance of the gospel. Now, yours is going to differ, because you're not gifted as I am. Uh, you may not even be a married person with a, a child or a family. And so your statement will differ, and it may differ over the course of life as life unfolds. But um, every Christian should start out a purpose statement to glorify God, and then consider, what has God given me that I can use to serve him um, with my personality, my gifts, my life situation, and I'm urging you, write that down so you can look at it often, and then uh, you'll know why God has you on this earth, and you won't be on your deathbed saying, boy, I watched a lot of great TV, but that wasn't very fruitful, was it? Uh, or, you know, I spent hours and hours playing computer games. What did that get me? No, those are not good godly purposes. Uh, you want to have God's purpose for your life as paramount. Secondly, then based on that, establish biblical goals for every area of your life to help move you toward that life purpose. So the purpose is broad and general and lifelong. The goals are more specific, short-term, um, attainable thing. You know, this year or in three months, I want to have read through the Bible once or twice or, you know, those kind of specific time-oriented goals. And again, Paul illustrates this with that analogy of the athlete. To get to his goal of winning, he brings every area of his life under that purpose. He controls his diet, he gets proper rest, he schedules regular workouts, uh, and it's all moving him toward the goal, I want to win the prize. That's the athlete analogy. And again, please understand, this is going to vary with every person here. So you're not me, I'm not you. Let's not judge one another on this. Let's judge ourselves. But um, you should determine your goals from the Bible, not from a worldly self-help book, and to that end, that sheet that is available at the exit there on um, biblical character qualities that will help you with yourself and if you're a parent, with your kids. Uh, and then on the back, there's some spiritual diagnostic questions to help you try to evaluate, here's where I'm at and here's where I need to grow. Your main goal should include developing loving relationships. Um, that's the second great commandment. Love God, love your neighbor. Uh, properly managing your time and money in light of uh, God's purposes. And then being a good steward of whatever spiritual gifts that God has given you so that one day you'll hear, well done, good and faithful servant. He may have only given you the one talent. Don't bury it. Use it. And uh, use it for his glory. And I would urge you, don't write down 15 goals. You know, I'm going to read the Bible for an hour a day, and you won't make it, and you'll get discouraged. Whittle it down to two or three. Make it, yeah, it stretches a bit, but it's attainable. And go for that. The third step is commit yourself to these goals. Uh, biblical goals provide the motivation to change, but you have to count the cost and realize this is going to be a commitment. For example, I, I really admire people who speak more than one language, and I've often wished I could speak more than one language, but you know what? I haven't committed myself to that goal. I think I could still do it at my old age, but it takes time, and discipline, and effort, and memorization, and all of those things that people who can speak a foreign language do. Um, 
So before you commit yourself to a spiritual goal, think about what it will require and whether you have the time and the, um, the desire to commit to follow through. And again, your motive isn't self-improvement for self-improvement's sake, it's to please God. I want to please God with what he's given me. Fourthly, then plan specifically how to reach these goals. And that means you have to prioritize and schedule them. Um, you might have 15, as I said. Boil it down to two or three. This is the most important one. For example, if I could get very personal, if your marriage is falling apart because you have an angry temper, uh, I think controlling your temper is your main goal. And you need to figure out biblically how you can do that so you're not flying off the handle at your wife or kids uh, all the time because that is hindering your relationships with God and with your family. Uh, another example, if your life is dominated by drug or alcohol abuse, obviously your number one goal has to be, I, I got to get over this stuff and please God with my life. Um, and so you prioritize your goals and then you put them in your schedule. If they're not in your schedule, they're not going to happen. And so it means maybe setting the alarm early, getting up in time to have time with the Lord before you rush off. It might mean disciplining your time, putting it in your schedule to memorize scripture a lot of relevant scripture to all the problems we face. Um, it might mean scheduling a weekly meeting with a small group, guys and guys, or women with women. Um, it might mean breaking off certain harmful habits that pull you down, maybe ungodly friendships, maybe you're watching video content that is just defiling. Uh, you might have to limit your computer or phone use. Many, many things that enter in that you, you have to prioritize them and schedule them or they won't happen. And then, <clears throat> fifthly, implement, evaluate, and correct your goals as necessary. And that just means taking a few minutes, maybe Sunday evening, sit down, get out your sheet, look at where you're at. Oops, this week. I didn't do so well, or yeah, this week went pretty well, and you may have to tweak it as you go. I got out my goals for this year last night and realized two or three of them aren't going to happen. Uh, I just didn't do it this year. Uh, two or three of them, yeah, I, I am going to accomplish. And if you don't have a goal, as they say, aim at nothing and you'll hit it every time, so the goal gives you something to aim at, and if you fall short, that's okay. Uh, maybe it was too high of a goal. Maybe it wasn't realistic. I need to readjust that, so you do that each week. And then sixthly, walk by means of the Holy Spirit every day, and that undergirds the whole process. Verse 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And he goes on, as we read, to talk about these strong desires of the, of the flesh that war against the spirit. And if you don't conquer those things, you won't grow in Christ-likeness, in godliness. Um, and, you know, walking um, is a deliberate process. It's not as spectacular as running. I used to like to run. I can't do that anymore because of my old age conditions, but I do walk. And if you walk toward a destination long enough, step by step by step, there may be a fall along the way. <clears throat> you get up, dust yourself off, you, you keep going, you'll get there. It's kind of slow. <clears throat> but... Um, it's the process the Bible describes. And as I mentioned, fruit is deliberate and slow. You have to prune the tree and 
fertilize the tree, water the tree, uh, protect it from the elements, and eventually you may get some fruit. But the question is, are you actively, purposefully walking in dependence on the Spirit, step by step, day by day, when you fail, get up, keep walking. Um, that's the process here. And the fruit of the Spirit, which includes self-control, will be growing in your life. Finally, <clears throat> where do you need self-control? Well, this is going to overwhelm you probably, but bottom line, you need self-control in every area of your life. And I'll just mention seven here and ask you to prayerfully evaluate which ones you need to bump to the top of the list. First of all, the Bible is clear. You and I need to control our bodies. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And <clears throat> Paul says, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 that you are to glorify God with your body. In the context, he's talking about sexual purity, but that applies to all of life. It means getting the proper rest where you avoid, on the one hand, laziness, too much rest. On the other hand, workaholism, where you don't get enough rest and burn out. So rest. Uh, it means getting proper exercise. Uh, I used to, uh, believe it or not, back 45 years ago when I started in ministry, one of my goals was I wanted to exercise 30 minutes a day, three days a week. I wasn't doing it. So I put that in my goals. Now it's no longer a goal. Why? Because it's a habit. It's just part of my life. And I do over an hour. If I don't get an hour and a half of exercise a day, I think, man, something's wrong today. I just do it. It's become a habit because it was a goal. And it's going to vary. Some people can't exercise 10 minutes because of physical problems. Others can. So you have to adjust this for where you're at. It means eating a healthy diet of moderate proportions. We all can control that. Uh, our culture bombards us with junk food. And um, the problems that come from that are not healthy. So you have to control yourself and say, no, you know, I, I can't eat that. Or at least certainly not as a regular thing. So again, it's going to vary person to person. So please apply this as where you're at, how you can move to the next level. And it takes a long time. So uh, that's one of the goals I failed at this year was I wanted to lose an inch around my waist. And it hasn't happened. Uh, I'm still working at it, but it just is hard to get that down to where I want it to be. Um, as I mentioned, controlling your body also means controlling your sexual desires. God gave us those desires, but he intends them to be within the boundary of lifelong heterosexual marriage. I had to add that word heterosexual from the last time I preached this message because our culture has now accepted homosexual marriage, which is not godly marriage. A second area, control your mind. Our culture, I think more than any in history, bombards us with uh, media, and that media invariably has ungodly ways to live and to think. To be godly, you have to control your mind. Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true, honorable, right, lovely, uh, pure, of good repute, think on these things. Direct your mind. Colossians 3, 1 through 4, uh, set your mind on those things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, not on the earthly things, on those things above, so you can control your mind. And so what do you think about? You cannot engage in a life, secret life, of sexual lust or greed and become godly. You just can't. So you've got to judge that, what you think about. Uh, control what you read. 
read the Bible. You know, maybe you need to binge read the Bible. One time I did that. I, I set a goal to read the Bible in three months. It took me an hour a day, 90 days, and I got through the whole Bible. I'm not stopping to meditate, just reading it to get the content into my head. And um, read Christian books that will help you grow in godliness. And uh, one of the goals I did reach this year was the number of books I set to read. And I keep a list of the books I read and write them down, and then I look at them to see if I'm balanced in my reading and what I thought about the book, that sort of thing. And then put that in your schedule. Control what you expose your mind to. You cannot watch godless TV shows, movies, videos, uh, go on the internet and see all the crud that's there, uh, the social media stuff, and it doesn't affect you at all. It does. So you have to control that. Um, I generally do not watch R-rated movies. That's just my standard, because it bombards me with filthy words and violence and sex, and I don't need that. I got enough of that battle without watching that stuff to feed it. So I, once in a while, I will watch an R-rated movie if it has uh, other value, but very rarely. Thirdly, control your emotions. <clears throat> I've heard Christians say, emotions aren't right or wrong, they just are. That's, that's worldly nonsense. The Bible <clears throat> extols all kinds of emotions and uh, condemns others. Anger is an emotion, you know? Joy is an emotion. Peace is an emotion. Uh, many, many emotions. Um, and again, some of you are more genetically prone to depression or anxiety or impulsiveness or lust. And <clears throat> you got a harder battle than those who aren't. Okay, but these fruits of the Spirit are promised to all who walk by the Spirit. That's what Paul says. He doesn't say, you know, well, if you're prone to depression, you can scratch joy off the list. No, I got to work on that. That's one of the fruits that I struggle with. So, <clears throat> um, if you live by constantly yielding to your emotions, you won't grow in godliness. Self-control means I control my emotions for a higher goal. I want to please God. Uh, I could expand on all these, but for sake of time, control your time is number four. <clears throat> I just wrote a book on uh, when I find time of New Year's sermons, and this message is one of the chapters in that book, but often we say, I just don't have time. But you know, we all have time to do what we want to do, don't we? And so you have to say, I want to be godly. And so I will make time or that. Oh, I, I have some water here, but thank you. <clears throat> I think it's water I'm drinking. It's in a black cup. <clears throat> thank you, though. <clears throat> um, so, again, you have to just evaluate your schedule. Control your finances, number five. <clears throat> we often complain, I don't have the money. And again, uh, we're spending money here, spending money there, running up credit card debt, and not giving consistently to the Lord's work. Usually, I know there are exceptions, medical bills that you can't afford, that kind of thing. Usually, though, if you're in debt to credit cards, and you're, you're out of control. Godly people should be giving generously to the Lord's work and not be in debt. And I'll put it real bluntly, there are certain things you might think are necessities and they aren't. You know, cable TV or streaming services, you don't need that. It's not a necessity. Dinner's out, expensive entertainment, not necessities. Now, if you can pay your bills and give generously, then those things are permissible. 
Uh, <clears throat> having the latest cell phone or other technology, some people think that's a necessity. Maybe if it's your business, yeah, but for a lot of us, it's just a temptation to run up more debt. Uh, six, control your tongue. Bible says a lot about that. Abusive speech, words that tear down others, even in jest or sinful, angry words, name calling, uh, lying, talking inappropriately about sex, telling dirty jokes. The Bible condemns all of those as sin. Gossip, slander, taking the Lord's name in vain. Here's a verse for you to memorize, Ephesians 4.29. I wish every Christian would learn it. Let no unwholesome word, the Greek there is no rotten word, proceed out of your mouth, but only such a word is as good for edification. In other words, it builds up others according to the need of the moment that it might give grace to those who hear. Boy, if we would practice that, our homes would be very different. Um, so to please God, you have to control your tongue. James says a few things about that as well, as you know. And then finally, control your relationships. And I don't mean act in a controlling manner in your relationships. I mean control who you spend your time with and why you do it. You might have to take the initiative to distance yourself from someone who's always bringing you down and where you used to live. Peter talks about that in 1 Peter 4. Um, if you're involved with an unbeliever, don't be unequally yoked. First, 2 Timothy 6, I mean 2 Corinthians 6. Um, if you're single, don't date unbelievers even to share the gospel with them. Evangelistic dating is not good. You get involved emotionally, and the next thing, well, he's promised to go to church with me, and I think you'll become a Christian. Yeah, right, and I've seen that over and over and over end in disaster. Um, your purpose in friendships with unbelievers should be clear. Jesus was a friend of sinners, but he wasn't there to carouse with them. He was there to evangelize them. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad company corrupts good morals. So you have to draw some lines there. Positively, in relationships, work on developing loving relationships starting in your home or with those you live with. That's where it should start. Christian homes, uh, as I wrote in another book, should be a refuge of love, a place where love exudes out of that home life. And um, practice that on a daily basis. You say, what's that mean? 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. Am I being patient and kind with my mate, with my kids? That's where it starts. Um, you might ask God for a more mature man, if you're a man or a woman, if you're a woman who could help you uh, be a closer in your walk with Christ. Now, my concern in this message, and I've been praying a lot about this this week, and I've already mentioned it, is you're going to be overwhelmed because I've covered a lot, and that will lead to paralysis and procrastination. Just ask God, give me two at the most, maybe three at the most, things from this message I need to apply that are the most going to make the biggest difference in my life and my walk with God. And then start there. And you'll have time for the others later, but prioritize it, put it in your schedule, and if you fall, get up and keep walking by the Spirit, and as you do, God will work in you this fruit of the Spirit, which includes self-control. Let me pray for us. Dear Lord, your word shows us how to be like you in every area. I pray if any are here who have never fled to the cross, repented of their sins, and trusted in Jesus, that that would be their first thing they focus on.
as a result of this message. For those of us who are your children and yet, <clears throat> like little kids, we need to grow and we often throw temper tantrums and do other things that are displeasing to you, I pray that you would help us to honor Christ by walking in the Spirit and seeing this fruit of the Spirit develop in our lives in the coming year. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name.